Hello, everyone. I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR, and I want to welcome the more than 1,000 participants who are joining us live for this conversation. If you're new to this PHR weekly series, this is the 30th panel since March, where PHR has hosted advocates on a wide range of topics, bringing a science-based approach to health and human rights, which is particularly crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic. As human rights humanitarian advocates and journalists, we deal with some of the most challenging, protracted and painful issues resulting from the profound inequalities and inequities that we find in our society, but probably none are more horrifying and shameful than the policy of separating families. And today I'm really honored to have such an esteemed panel with us to discuss the impacts of the US administration's family separation policy and the ongoing work to reunite children and families um, this is an amazing group of people, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all today. So I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Renit Mishori. Always grateful to have Renit join us and moderate our discussion. She's the senior medical advisor to PHR and an incredible champion for migrant health. During the pandemic, she's played a leading role in PHR's partnerships with advocacy organizations dedicated to protecting healthcare workers, detention litigation, and refugee protection. Dr. Mishuri has been a member of PHR's Asylum Network since 2006 and has served as an expert consultant to PHR's program on sexual violence and conflict since 2011. So she is a, a close PHR ally and a remarkable advocate. She also serves as a faculty advisor to Georgetown University's Asylum Program and in her spare time is a practicing family physician Professor of Family Medicine at Georgetown and the Interim Chief Public Health Officer at Georgetown University, a very busy advocate. Renit, I turn it over to you to get our panel started and thank you. Thanks so much, Donna, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think we're all here because we recognize the depth and the breadth of the crisis that was created by the administration's immigration policies, including the family separation policy, as, John, as Donna mentioned, that we at PHR um, have called um, torture in our recent report and that the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, termed child abuse. I think we all believe that, um, you know, everyone here on the, on the webinar and uh, all of our uh, attendees right now with about a thousand of you, we, we all believe that we have a role to play in continuing to press for accountability and justice. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And what I'll do is introduce our panelists who um, cover a range of expertise from um, law to medicine to advocacy and journalism. And we will start with the, one of our superstars an incredible, a really incredible PHR supporter, uh, Jacob Sabroff. Um, he is a correspondent for NBC News and for MSNBC and one of the first journalists to report on the family separation policy for which he received the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award and the Hillman Prize. He is the author of a New York Times bestseller called Separated Inside an American Tragedy and I'll do a little Donna um, and uh, a little Vanna White um, impersonation <laughs> here with your with your book, it's worth reading. And if you haven't read it yet, this is a fantastic read, uh, sad and depressing at times, but really incredibly interesting. So, um, so Jacob, um, you and your colleagues have been reporting on the immigration crisis very, very intensively for a number of years now. And how did you first learn of some of these policies? And, and do you think that your reporting and your many scoops on the, on the topic have made any dent in the administration's uh, ability to implement such policies. You know, um, thank you, Dr. Mishori, and thanks to, to Physicians for Human Rights for hosting this. It's really great to be here um, with, with many people who I admire um, very deeply um, and have really gotten to know um, over the course of covering this. The, the, the answer is, um, I don't know. You know, I think that, I guess that that's for other people to, to judge. One thing I will say is we're still talking about um, this heinous, heinous, act perpetrated upon thousands of people by the Trump administration um, three years later. And I think that um, in a horrible situation, that's a good thing. Um, you know, I, I, I consider myself, um, as I've said to you before, a really unlikely eyewitness to what hopefully one day we'll all remember as one of the most shameful chapters in modern American history. Something I think that, you know, it's my son's fifth birthday today when he's old enough to learn about this. He'll remember it in line with, um, 
Native American genocide and slavery and Japanese internment and the turnaround of the St. Louis to send Jews back to the Holocaust. I mean, I think that what this government did on purpose to these families and these children, you guys have described it as torture. Um, Colin Kraft, who was then the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics called it government sanctioned child abuse. And I think that at the time, um, when I started covering this, I could not um, possibly comprehend how the American government was doing this. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't know how to answer your question. All I know is that what I've tried to do is be honest about how I learned about this and my perception of it. And the truth is, I didn't see it coming. There were many other people, including many other journalists, like Caitlin Dickerson at the New York Times or Julia Ainsley, my colleague at NBC, or, or Lomi Creel at the Houston Chronicle at the time, who did document the run up to this. Uh, you know, folks on the ground, like you all who were doing the work, Lee, who filed the Miss L lawsuit in February, uh, long before anybody started talking about this. Um, and so, um, so I don't know, you know, but, but here we are having this conversation, which I think is a very positive sign, whether it was due to our reporting or really the collective work of everybody, you know, I think probably the latter. trouble with my audio for some reason. So you'll have to excuse me for one second. Can you hear us okay now? Okay, I don't know if you can hear me now. We can. Perfect. All right, I, I apologize about that. But uh, techno te technology is um, unfortunately prone to surprising us. Um, so uh, I couldn't hear you when you finished, uh, if you finished speaking, Jacob, so forgive me, and I'm assuming that you have. Uh, and I'm going to go um, to Lee, um, Lee Gillard, um, who is a civil rights lawyer at the ACLU, and, and the lead attorney, as, as Jacob mentioned, in the lawsuit that successfully challenged the Trump administration's family separation practice. And uh, Lee, your work was um, on this case was featured in the recent documentary called The Fight. And um, I talked to us a little bit about the different numbers that we see, what we get in the media. Um, there's the number of people there, I think it's 628 of, of uh, families who are, have not been um, reunified and that we know of, but is that the full number and that, that expresses the situation right now on the ground of how many families are separated and who is um, not or is being reunified with whom? Yeah, so, well, I, I, you know, like Jacob said, I, I really appreciate um, th this webinar to get get these issues out there. So there are a number a number of numbers, so to speak, um, out there. And let me just clarify as best I can very quickly. The total number of separations that we believe the Trump administration has subjected families to is close to 5,500, and that's a number I think that gets forgotten. The administration tries to justify about 1,400 of those based on claiming the parent was a danger to the child. We don't actually believe that, but in any event, that would still leave 4,000. So that's an enormous number that I think gets lost. The 628 number that you mentioned are parents of 628 children that we have yet to find this many years into it. And I would say one thing about that very quickly. We have been asking the Trump administration for any data, contact information they have for years. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we finally got additional data that we hope will allow us to find families, phone numbers and addresses. They have not disclosed that for months and months and months, despite knowing we are having trouble finding the families, and despite repeated requests for all data they have. But I also wanna make one other point very clear. The 628 is the number of parents we have not found, but there are many more families that are still separated. We have found hundreds and hundreds of other families where the parent was deported without their child, who the Trump administration will not allow the parent to return to the United States to rejoin their child. So those are families that are still separated we have found. So the 628 is just who we haven't found, but many, many more families remain separated. And I, you know, and I will answer the question you asked Jacob that he was too modest to answer. Yes, his reporting has been absolutely critical. 
in pushing this issue, keeping it alive. He and other, other journalists he's mentioned and, and others as well. Uh, and there is no substitute for keeping the issue alive in the public, public outcry. I think every civil rights lawyer will tell you there's only so much you can do in the courts without public outcry. And I think the reason we got this, this data most recently is because Jacob's articles and other people triggered a global outcry and to the point where the issue actually reached the second presidential debate level. And I think that's why the government felt like they had to come forward with this remaining data. The only thing I wanted to say very quickly is, you know, I think, and, and I think this is something that everyone on this panel knows, the numbers tell one story, but really they only tell part of the story. I think the danger is that the aggregate numbers and abstract policy arguments will blur the human dimension of that. And I know others are gonna talk about that, but just for me, the little, the human stories, and sometimes they're not even the objectively worst cases, but just stick in your mind. A little four-year-old boy who couldn't, didn't see well and needed glasses and parents were from very modest means and were able to get him a pair of glasses, scrape together the money, but they knew they couldn't afford a second pair if they broke, so they got him a pair, of, I got him a glasses case. And that glasses case was everything to them. And when they came to take the little four-year-old boy away, he was begging and screaming, don't take me away. And fortunately he was wearing his glasses, but he didn't have his glasses case. So all day long, all the mother thought about is, can my little boy see? Will they give him a safe place to put his glasses? Will they get him a new pair if they break? You know, just little horrific stories like that are, I think, really what this is about. Yes, thank you for mentioning the human dimension. And these are, you know, heartbreaking stories. And each and every one, every person is from our research at PHR has a story that uh, would break your heart. And in the aggregate, when we're just talking about numbers, it's very, very difficult, as you said, to, to appreciate the depth of cruelty and, and the depth of, um, of um, the, the um, indignities that um, that these people um, in, in trying to come to a safer safer harbor um, have experienced at the hands of the, the administration. Um, speaking of the human dimension, we have uh, Rebecca Sanchez Ralda with us. She's a Guatemalan human rights lawyer and member of the Justice in Motion Defender Network. The organization conducts on the ground searches for parents uh, who were separated from their children and helps them um, access legal representation. She maintains a private law practice in Guatemala City and uh, it is focused on family law and the rights of children and adolescents. So Rebecca, speaking of this, this human um, aspect, uh, tell me um, or t tell us um, how do parents react when you actually find them and, and is it, do you think it's possible to track down all the parents and also can you give us a little bit of color, describe what are the challenges on the ground um, to, uh, to find these parents and especially now during a pandemic? Thank you for having me here. Thank you for this space. Uh, as you were saying, I'm a lawyer. I'm based in Guatemala City and I'm a member of the Justice in Motion Defender Network since many years ago. And we have been conducting the searches for, for parents since 2018 till nowadays. And we are based all around the country. Uh, we're based in Mexico and Central America. We work uh, as a network. We're lawyers in the United States for helping migrants to have access to justice across borders. So their, their job model is doing international collaborations. Um, in Guatemala, we're about a dozen of defenders doing this research. And it's been difficult. Uh, because we don't have too much information about the parents. And once we, we finally reach them out, they always uh, react with distrust, right? Because they never ever think that someone could be looking for them. Uh, and besides that, they always ask why we are looking for them, why we, we have their personal information. So it's our job to gain the trust of them. And during this pandemic, it's been so difficult because we had many movement restrictions. Besides that, we didn't want to spread the virus all around or to get the virus into communities where there, there are no uh, 
access to the health services. So we have to stop the searches for around eight months. Uh, I know that there are folks from the network that have resumed the searches and taking all the necessary measures like uh, wearing face ma mask, face shields, gloves, alcohol, and we're still in the commitment to, to doing these, these searches. And Guatemala is not an easy country despite the size, because it's a, a small country, but it's really difficult. I'm based in Guatemala City, but most of the migrants live in the highlands. So it takes so long to travel to those places. Many of them are Mayan indigenous communities. So sometimes they don't speak Spanish, they only speak the indigenous language. And that's one of the strengths of the network because there are folks who, sp who speaks besides the Spanish, another indigenous language. Uh, you have to know the context because there are communities that are suffering from prim prime organized uh, treatments like uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking. So you have to consider all that situations before doing a research. So you have to know the context and that's the context in which we develop the, the searches. It's not being easy, but we are in the struggle of it. And so you literally go door to door and knock on people's door, is that what happens? Or um, who do you, who do you um, collaborate with in, on the US side? How, how do you get the names? Well, uh, we collaborate with the ACLU and other organizations like Women's Refugee and Always a law firm. And we receive the, the name of the parents from the US government, but we have poor information. We only have the name of the kids. Uh, we receive an address, but usually it's inaccurate information. So we have, we're forced to do more research in public records where we receive pretty much general information about the kids and the, and the parents. We only know the full name and the place of birth, but we always try to gather as much as information possible to have more clues for, for where, from where to start to look. And once we identify a community or a town, we make contact with a community leader because we need their permission to get into the community and we do the physical search. Uh, once we get to, once we reach the community, we make contact with, we make contact with, contact with the community leader and ask him for help. And actually we do the searches on foot, going by knocking doors and asking to the neighbors, uh, church leaders. So sometimes involves uh, climbing mountains, crossing rivers and it could take a long time especially because we don't have too much time during the day because it takes a lot of time to get in the, to the communities and for sleeping you have to travel to other area where you could find an old hotel to to take rest so it, that all that involves uh, doing these physical searches it sounds uh, incredibly important and uh, one can understand definitely the, the suspicion uh, on the part of, of the parents and we're going to talk a little bit about that later, but I want to go to um, Karen Deepkower. She's a psychiatrist, a member of our um, asylum network. We have more than 1700 members uh, throughout the United States and through the PHR asylum network, um, Dr. Kaur has provided psychiatric evaluations of separated and reunited mothers uh, at the Dilly Center in Texas. It's a family detention center. Um, Dr. Kaur has also helped PHR with uh, various advocacy efforts against family separation, including in our recent meeting with the Department of Homeland Security. And Dr. Kaur, um, you, you evaluated families in Dili in, in 2015, which was during the Obama administration uh, and also during this administration. So describe to us, first of all, what it is that you've seen sort of inside these detention centers. I don't think a lot of people have a, an idea of what it looks like and, and how people are being treated and how their, their distress is being manifested. And, and is there a difference between what you've seen during the Obama administration and what you've seen during this administration? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
One of the striking things is that when you enter these facilities, you have very limited access to you know, where you can go. It's not like you can just kind of stroll around and look and, and see what the living arrangements are like. So um, each time that I've gone, there's sort of a waiting area with multiple rooms that we would conduct the interviews in. Um, so we don't have open access, we have asked. Um, I specifically talked to somebody there but they always kind of give you the runaround and, or say you need some sort of a, a legal clearance um, to see what, what it's like. Um, so really the only way to find out is by interviewing the people who are living there. But I think what's so striking um, when we talk about um, kind of seeing these mothers um, prior to the zero tolerance policy being implemented and afterwards, the similarity is that, you know, both of these groups come from the same sort of traumas. They have the same challenges that they're trying to get away from, right? So there's the fear of persecution, death, violence, hunger, extreme poverty. And they are truly coming to the border seeking a better life for themselves and their families. And, um, Unfortunately, that's where sort of the similarity ends for these two groups. Um, prior to this policy, when I had been in 2015, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to sit with these mothers and hear the traumas that they've experienced, but there's, there's a sense of hope. They feel like they are being seen, they are being heard, they have a chance, you know, versus after when I went in the summer of 2018, um, it's almost like stepping into like the twilight zone, right? So it's the same waiting area with the same rooms that I have sat with before with these mothers. But I just remember sitting in this room with this one mother and it's almost like every air particle in that room is saturated by this deep anguish and this deep sorrow. And all you can really do is just breathe it in. All the time realizing that this mother has been living this reality, has been breathing this from the moment her six-year-old child was separated from her, you know? And so it, it was such a blessing because I, I, I'm not fluent uh, Spanish speaker, so there was an interpreter in the room, but it gave me a little bit of a reprieve when the interpreter, interpreter was speaking to just kind of wrap my head around this sort of disbelief that you have listening to what the mother is telling you. Um, you kind of, uh, you know, you kind of go, this is happening in the United States of America. This is happening in my backyard. You know, I live in Houston, Texas. So it, you have to kind of settle with that as you listen to what they're telling you. And, um, you know, just, just this particular mother, what she was narrating, she had come in right before the actual implementation of the policy. Um, and so two days later after it was officially announced is when at 2 a.m. in the morning, her and her daughter um, had been at the facility for about 10 days at that point. And so 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, the officers come in, wake them up and inter start interrogating her. And arrest her all in front of her six-year-old child. And it, it is this very chaotic scene that she has no clue what's going on. The child is screaming. She is completely in disbelief about what is happening. And, um, and so as she describes the scenario of her child seeing her be arrested, being told that she's under arrest for illegally entering the country and that she's now going to be punished for that um, and having no idea where her child is being taken to where she's been taken to and so as she talks about that experience you know I mean it, we tried to retain always a certain level of professionalism but that was a very tall order speaking to these mothers um, to not feel that emotion and the horror of what they had experienced, you know. And, and my, my youngest at that time was around that same age, she was five. So it was sort of, it, it was just jarring 
um, to, to think about that this was happening and in the United States of America under this administration. Yeah, I mean, I think as a, as a parent, um, you can absolutely relate on the most basic cellular level, uh, but you don't have to be a parent, obviously, to be horrified by, by the situation. And, and as we know, um, it, it's not over. So I, I, I wanna, we're getting so many questions and I, I wanna send a couple to, uh, to Jacob first. So um, is family separation still going on? And, and where are the 628 children? Um, and what, um, what do you know about what is still happening uh, right now? And, um, and how the, um, and who's, who's taking care of it? Who I know the ACLU is working on it, but Jacob, from a kind of a more global picture, what, what is the situation at the moment? Well, a couple of things. One is I think we have a much broader, deeper understanding of how this happened um, today than we did at, you know, when Lee filed the lawsuit or um, even when Rebecca and her colleagues started the searches or certainly when I was in the detention centers. And these are, these are questions I think Lee can actually answer better than I can. But let me ask Lee, since we're here together, um, ACLU has said since the policy ended zero tolerance by the judge's order in the summer of 2018, over a thousand, you had mentioned over a thousand separations was the official tally. Is that still, is that still the case? Oh, I think you're muted, Lee. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so a few things there. One is that I think very few people know that after the ACLU got the policy stopped, the government continued to separate children between 1,100 and 1,200 were separated after the court told them to stop the family separation practice. And what the government, and the reason the number hasn't gone up in the last eight months or so, Jacob, as you know, is because there's a new policy that's really horrendous that bars any child or adult from coming in the country now on the pretext that it's necessary for COVID. But the 1100 to 1200, what the government said is, well, look, we know because of the ACLU's lawsuit, we can't have a policy of automatically separating children, but we can still separate where they, we believe in an individual case the parent presents a danger. So we said, well, that's a lot of children you're making that determination. These aren't child welfare experts, they're CBP and ICE officials. And we said, well, let's let us see the list and the reasons. It turns out they're separating, saying the parent is too dangerous to be with the child because they had a DUI offense 10 years ago or a nonviolent theft offense 10 years ago, or because they entered the country illegally. In one case, uh, a border patrol officer said the father wasn't changing diapers quick enough and therefore he was a serious danger to the child. He was neglecting the child. So that's horrendous. And so that's gone on since the injunction. In terms of the 628, because we haven't found them, we don't know where they are, but we do know that they're out of detention at this point. And they're either with a relative, but often with a relative they've never met before. It could be a third cousin or they are in foster families. Um, and ultimately what we need to do, what the Biden administration needs to do is allow all the parents to come back to the United States, to rejoin their children in the United States because the Trump administration has given the parents only two choices. Either you remain permanently separated or you bring your child back to Central America to the very danger they fled. And that's one of the reasons for Rebecca. It's so hard, not only do they have to gain the trust of the parent, but then they have to tell them the Trump administration is giving you these two horrendous choices. So the parents need to be allowed to come back, but then all the families who have been separated need to be given some form of legal status. The Trump administration, what I think a lot of people don't know is even when we reunite the families in the United States, they're still trying to deport them the children and the parents. They need to be given legal status. We need to make them as whole as possible. We'll never completely undo the damage, you know, because the trauma is potentially <clears throat> irreparable, but we need to do everything possible, including a fund for medical and, and other needs. The only other thing I wanted to say very quickly is a point you asked Rebecca about where she's getting the information. So what happened was the Trump administration said, well, we don't think these parents should be even part of the ACLU case if we already deported them. And the judge said, well, that's that's crazy because they're in even a worse situation. Not only do they not have their kid, but they're in another country and don't have any idea what's happening in their country. And the government said, well, your honor, if you're gonna make them part of the case, we're not going to look for them. So I had to st stand up in court and said, your honor, 
we will find them. And so uh, we took that on, the ACO took that on, and we created a steering committee that involves Justice in Motion, the Women's Refugee Commission, Kids in Need of Defense, and the law firm Paul Weiss, They're the ACLU steering committee to help find the children. And we get contact information from the government, and then we pass it on to Rebecca and the other human rights defenders. The problem is that because the separations occurred so long ago, the contact information is largely useless and the Trump administration has not been forthcoming. Finally, we got additional contact information. We hope that that's helpful, but ultimately what Rebecca is doing is so courageous and so hard looking for families in Central America and now on top of that COVID and the hurricanes. And what we hope is that it'll be easier to find families once if the Biden administration says, you can actually come back. Then, you know, at this point, the Trump administration is giving them that agonizing choice that no parent would ever want to face. Speaking of the work that Rebecca is doing, um, we're getting a, a bunch of questions. And, and one theme is, how do you confirm that a child, a child belongs to a parent and the role of DNA data? Um, we, we got a question about, are you, are you using DNA data? Is that a problem or should you use it? Um, and is it even feasible to, if it were available to, to, to use that given, you know, issues of, of skepticism and, 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 um, and um, uh, ethics of using DNA. Well, uh, I cannot answer to that question about the DNA, but for the research, we, as I was saying before, uh, we do research in public records where we could have, where we have basic information and personal information about the parents. So at the moment that we found someone that we think could be the parent that we're looking for, we ask them the question. So uh, when we are sure, we put them in contact with the US lawyers, but we always uh, make, make them a lot of questions to be sure that he or she is the person that we are looking for. So, Lee, as far as you know, there's no, at this point, there's no role for, for DNA. Um, I know, we know that at some point there was, some DNA was collected and it raised a lot of questions about collection of DNA from uh, people. Yeah, no, I can answer that. Um, I, I think, you know, as a background principle, the ACLU and other advocates are very concerned about the collection of DNA and what will happen to it. But there has been a role for DNA because what the government tried to do in the beginning was say, well, we don't think this parent is really the parent. And so the initial case, the lead plaintiff, Miss L, who came from the Congo, she actually came to the country legally, stopped at a port of entry and said, I need to apply for asylum with my seven-year-old daughter. They took the daughter away, sent the daughter to Chicago, kept the mother in San Diego. And we found out about the case. It was the initial case four months later. And the mother had no idea why they took the child away. We went to court. And the government said, well, maybe it wasn't the parent. So we had to take the child away because she didn't have documents. Well, of course she didn't have documents. She had been come by foot for three months from the Congo. Um, and we said, well, look, the child looks exactly like the parent. The little girl was screaming, mommy, mommy, don't let them take me away. Of course it was the parent. And the judge cut through it all and said to the government, have you done a DNA test if you're genuinely believe that this isn't the parent, it's a trafficker? Government said, well, no, we didn't. They did a DNA test. Of course, it was the parent. So the, that has been used in the US where the government's claiming trafficking. The families that Rebecca's looking for are all families where the government admits it's the biological parent and we're giving Rebecca the information. So all she needs to do is verify with the parent a few questions about the child, but there's not really a dispute about whether it's the biological parent, the hard part is, as Rebecca said, is finding them. Um, I, I wanna ask um, Dr. Kaur a question. Um, and, and Lee um, has told us some of the kind of the, the stories and narratives of, of the individuals that uh, he encountered that, that part, were part of the, of the lawsuit. And so, you know, when you hear about a child screaming, screaming mommy, mommy, and you think about the deep trauma that both the child and, and the parent um, are experiencing and the trauma, as we know, is something that can last for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about what is this trauma um, how does it manifest in the in the immediate 
time immediately after the separation and, and whether and how it can last for a long time and what needs to be done um, to try to maybe not lessen the trauma, but it, to manage it or treat it somehow? Well, in, in a case like this, not to have these kinds of policies that are so traumatizing, but you know the implication of trauma on children is just overarching and profound. It affects every aspect of their development, right? So the brain is this wonderfully complex organ um, that continues to evolve and develop into our mid-20s. Um, and it is a very experience-dependent organ. Right? So the experiences we have as children really shape how we see ourselves, how we see the world, how we see our place in this world. And so the, the relationships we have and the security in those re relationships really shape the entirety of our lives. Right? So if a child has very traumatic experiences, you know, that part of our brain called the amygdala starts firing off. It's like the alarm bell saying, hey, there's danger out there. Do something to, to stay alive. Right. So that's where the fight, flight, free, submit kind of options come in. And so when a child goes through something this traumatic, at a time when they really need support more than ever before, and they're left alone, um, you know, m uh, transported um, hundreds of miles away from their families, you you have basically um, put them in a situation where you have emotionally kind of blindfolded them. They no longer have any guidance onto how to deal with this. There's no containment that can take place at this time. So, uh, and this has great impacts on, on the brain's development, right? So this child, even after when it's in a safer environment, will always be uh, sort of attuned to danger, will always be in this hypervigilant state. And that comes at a cost. Um, and that cost is anytime you sort of upregulate one part of the brain, you're going to downregulate another part. You're going to underdevelop things that are important for learning, for problem solving, for memorizing, for emotional regulation. So you take all that away from a child at that point. And so when they do eventually are, you know, placed in a school setting, they're going to have learning disabilities. They're going to have lower IQs. Um, they're going to act out because of that, or they're going to be really withdrawn because of that. And they're going to have lower self-esteem related to their peers, right? So that kind of starts this snowball effect. So children who don't feel like they're learning or can learn will then um, check out. They'll drop out of school eventually you know, they'll get into more illegal um, uh, kinds of issues, uh, whether that's substance use, um, they'll have higher rates of incarceration, they'll have higher rates of medical issues like um, cardiovascular disease, obesity, depression, anxiety, suicidality. Um, and one of the other things that's really critical is we're disrupting the attachment, right? especially with these younger children who are under five. I mean, that's just a critical period where they need to know how to kind of relate to other, other people and, and trust themselves, trust the world around them. And secure attachment is sort of like the framework, the foundation for any further development to take place. And so when you've disrupted that, they have just a really hard time knowing how to form relationships. And in order to succeed in the world, as we all know, we need to know how to interact with people. We need to be able to re read social cues, you know, um, and, and, and regulate ourselves. So now we have, what we've done is basically kiboshed their learning. We have um, uh, kiboshed how they interact and build relationships with others. And medically, you know, um, put them at risk for various kinds of ailments. Yeah. Um, so this disruption isn't just a short-term thing that we can fix. So unless you know psychotherapeutic interventions um, take place, 
help is, is provided, we have basically set them up to fail. As so, Dr. Mishori, can I say something about that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the Trump administration knew all of this, you know, and I think that that's really important to underscore um, based on the reporting that, that I've done, that my colleagues have done, that other journalists have done. Um, they were warned from the earliest days of this policy, which is why, by the way, one official, as I write in the book, who was involved in the reunification said that this was the greatest human rights catastrophe of my lifetime, uh, dealing with domestic US um, affairs. Um, and says, you know, as, as Dr. Kaur says, this, you know, childhood trauma creates a century of suffering for these children. Their whole lives now will be defined by um, this experience. And not only were they warned in advance, but as I, I documented, um, Katie Miller, Stephen Miller's wife, um, attempted to get Commander Jonathan White, the lead HHS official involved in the reunifications, to, to lie, to suborn perjury about whether or not he believed this to be the case when he testified before Congress when the policy ultimately ended. And, and I'm not telling you this because I have a specific axe to grind with the Trump administration, although this is uniquely a, a heinous Trump administration policy. We came to this place and Trump was able to do this like this because of decades of deterrence-based failed punitive policies. And what the Trump administration did was uniquely reprehensible. Um, but look at what we know today. And, and I learned all this even after my, my book came out, as a matter of fact. Stephen Miller held a show of hands vote in the Situation Room with top cabinet level officials, including invitees, including the, the Secretary of State, John Bolton, um, not just the people that we associate being involved in this policy, Mark Short, you know, um, raise your hand if you wanna move forward with family separations. Uh, and sure enough, everybody did, except for Kirsten Nielsen, who ended up putting this policy into place anyways, after they were all warned. HHS warned, the child, um, uh, welfare experts warned that these would be the consequences. In ICE, they warned they wouldn't be able to reunite. We learned recently the DOJ career prosecutors warned that the children were too young, couldn't find their parents, and doing this was going to create not just a logistical, but a humanitarian disaster. And most recently, we learned that Stephen Miller blocked a fully negotiated settlement agreement after this policy was ended to provide mental health services uh, for the children who were traumatized and separated and abused by the administration, which delayed the implementation of those services uh, for months. Um, and as I'm sure any of you could explain far better than I could, that delay compounds the trauma. Um, and so it's, I, I say all this just to point out that what I've learned is that it's not some unintentional byproduct of a policy that went bad. This is what they knew would happen from day one. Um, and here we are today with 5,500 by, by the ACLU's count approximately, children who find themselves in this position, not because of some accident or not because of a simple logistical failure, but because of an intentional policy designed to harm the children and the parents. And they knew that, that what Kieran Deep just described would be exactly where we would be today. Um, and anybody who tells you otherwise is not telling the truth based on what we know from documents, from reporting, from sources, um, as of this moment. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jacob, for bringing this up because this is exactly in our report, you will never see your child again. We talked about the trauma and um, the impact, the severe suffering on these individuals, the parents and the children, but also the issue of intentionality uh, and the fact that it was carried out by a state, by policies of an administration, knowingly, it wasn't just a byproduct, as you said, and all of these issues, the intentionality, the severe and, and, and long-term suffering, and um, the, the, the idea that the policy was intended to um, coerce the people to not come across the border. I mean, all of these sort of, put together um, uh, created a situation where we at PHR have decided that this um, amounts to, to torture. If you think about the uh, definition of torture by the, uh, the, the United Nations Convention Against Torture. So um, the fact that it was approved at the highest, highest levels of government and the fact that um, it was done knowing that su such deep um, trauma was gonna be caused is, is just, um, unbelievable to, to, to all of us who have 
um, worked with government officials and uh, will continue to work with government officials. And speaking of government and what they knew and what uh, and when they knew it and what they decided to do with it. Now we, we have a new administration coming in and we're getting a lot of questions about um, what's going to happen. Um, and maybe this is for you, Jacob, or for Lee. So are, are we assuming that um, this is going to all end once, uh, you know, January 2021? No, um, no. Uh, yeah. It, I mean, that's my greatest worry, honestly, um, um, <laughs> is that People think that because they they that Donald Trump will no longer be here, um, this will will no longer be a problem. We don't have to worry about these issues about not only family separation but about very aggressive deterrence based policies designed to hurt people. Whether it's the expulsions that Lee mentioned under Title Forty Two or MPP making tens of thousands of people um, remain in Mexico or prolonged indefinite detention in you know, as advocates call them family jails, um, ICE calls them family residential centers euphemistically. I mean, there's all kinds of immigration policies that the Biden-Harris administration has not really gone on the record yet to say what they're gonna do about it. They've said they're gonna have a 100-day moratorium on deportations, but they won't even publicly commit yet to reuniting the, the thousands of families that are still separated, according to Lee, um, on US soil. And if you ask any of the advocates, I'm sure the folks Rebecca comes into contact with and Rebecca's colleagues come into contact with, would tell you that they don't want to be reunited in the place from which they fled, from the conditions from which Kieran Deep was talking about poverty and malnutrition and violence and persecution. Um, they came here for a reason. And so the Biden-Harris administration, um, they made a closing argument, as, as Lee said, at the debate, saying that this was criminal. Joe Biden said it twice, this is criminal. But did he really mean it? Um, because we don't know yet. And yes, he has said his Justice Department will be independent and make those determinations independently, but will there be some type of human rights commission to look into um, what was perpetrated by the Trump administration? Um, will, there, will there be a referral to some kind of outside entity? Anyway, those are all questions that we don't have the answer to, which is why I think it's more important, arguably now, for all of us to continue this conversation than it was even during the Trump administration when, everybody, when people in the audience at my network, the resistance, so to speak, um, we're very fired up about this. I think there's a big danger in people losing their attention span for this. Um, and, and that worries me quite a bit. Yeah, so exactly the, the where I wanted to go with this is what is our role of people on, on this webinar? Everybody is is still fired up and want, want to do something. Um, so in seeking accountability, maybe Lee, that's, um, I, I'm gonna ask you that question. So seeking accountability and justice for these individuals, what does it mean? Does it is it a, a truth and reconciliation, um, a, a, some sort of a, a mechanism or is it um, a criminal, uh, pressing criminal charges against the people who um, set these policies in motion, what, what does accountability look like in, in the coming years? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And let me start by just picking up on one point that, that Jacob and Jen, that you had asked him about, about what the Biden-Harris administration will do. I, I, I agree. We hope, expect that they will want to do something, but exactly what they want to do. And I think it's critical for people to be speaking out and letting the incoming administration know that this is a, a important issue, a moral issue for, for people, because it's very easy. They're going to have so many issues on their plate when they come in, and it is critical that this not get lost. If they are really going to do anything, I think they need to hear from the public. So people should not underestimate how important the public outrage was in stopping the family separation policy in the beginning and how important it will be to move forward. In, in terms of accountability, I think we would like to see Congress hold hearings, whether there needs to be some independent commission, possibly. We have brought a suit where we have sued individually officials involved in it, everybody from Stephen Miller to Sessions. But that's a civil suit. We, you know, we can't, as a, as a nonprofit, as an NGO, bring a criminal action. People are calling for some type of criminal action my own sense is that that will not happen under a Biden administration, but I don't think there's any reason not to keep putting it out there and be labeling it torture like you all have and child abuse. Um, ultimately, as, as Jacob said, I think it needs to get into the history books. I mean, I don't want 20 years from now, somebody say, well, I never heard of that family separation. I mean, I think it's critical we keep it, we keep it alive. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the most dangerous thing was when 
it sort of fell off the radar screen and no one realized that we still hadn't found all these families. And, and, as, and as Dr. Paris said, you know, the trauma is there. It's not just gonna go away. One of the first families that we reunited, I went to visit them and it was a four-year-old boy. And the mother said to me, all he keeps asking is, are they gonna come and take me away again in the middle of the night? Left alone, that kind of trauma is just not gonna go away. It needs real medical attention. So in addition to all this accountability, we would like to see a fund created to help these families, not just with medical needs, but basic necessities because they are really struggling. And I think the public can get involved in even little acts of kindness, helping one child uh, pay for a tutor or tutoring a child, little basic things. I think there's always a tendency to feel like if you can't solve the entire problem, then there's really nothing to do. But it's, and that's what I fear, especially for young people, they get overwhelmed by the problem and how big it is. But little, little acts of kindness, and there are places where I can send people where they, where they can do that. Um, little things can make such a big difference in these families' lives. Thank you. And, and we, we have very few minutes left um, together and, and the, the questions are just incredibly important and I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them. But what I'd like to do is just go around and for every one of you um, in your own little world uh, or not so little world, um, what people want to help and as Lee was uh, giving us already some ideas. So so Rebecca, for, for activists, people are asking, what can I do to help reunite families? So very briefly, tell us what, what is it that people can do uh, to help your organization or other organizations or to bring parents and, and children together? Well, uh, Justice in Motion is a nonprofit organization and so they receive donations for continuing this type of work. So let's give you an idea how can you do this all this possible, maybe donating. And, and again, uh, just to wrap up with my intervention, uh, what I want to share with you that despite all the challenges, uh, despite all what the physical surges involves, we are committed to find all these parents because we want to find them out and to the parents that we already found, we want them to start the path of getting justice, right? We want justice for them and we're not going to rest until we found out every parent. Thank you. And, and, and Karen Deep, what can physicians and health workers do um, to address this issue um, and to seek justice and accountability? Um, so I think one of the things that I wanted to just point out is that the heart of this family separation policy at the heart of it is like this dehumanizing quality that it encapsulates. So when you have people in leadership like Donald Trump who can call these call this population criminals and murderers and rapists, right? Collectively, we it gives us permission to check out to some degree because we don't see ourselves that way. We don't see our loved ones that way but it also then allows these kinds of policy to take hold where human dignity, one's human um, value is no longer considered. So I think democracy is one of those things we have to be engaged in, right? Every, every citizen can be engaged in their own ways, whatever um, that may be. Um, you know, whatever skills, talents, education that you bring to the table that can you can use in various ways so you know just being engaged to listen to bear witness to to report to defend and and to bring people into office um, who can keep that kind of awareness um, at, at the forefront and PHR has a great asylum network program that continues to grow so for physicians and other clinicians who want to be part of this work um, it's pretty easy to get trained in doing so and I think we're gonna uh, post some um, ways of getting involved with PHR's Asylum Network and our other um, work. Um, Jacob, for you and, and the media, clearly I know you you didn't think you made a dent uh, early on, or maybe you don't you think so, but you didn't, uh, you're too humble to, to admit it, but um, what is moving forward? You already alluded to it that there, it's not over and then we need to continue pressing um, so what's the media's role in, in seeking accountability here and, and justice for these individuals? You are on mute, on mute, unfortunately. How's that? Perfect. I should know this by now. Um, 
sincerely, I really don't think, you know, it was me. And, and I do think if there's a lesson in the reporting that I've done is that I think I'm sort of a stand in for way too many people who did not ever fathom our government being able to do this. And as a journalist that says, you know, maybe I was the wrong guy to tell this story. I'm a white Jewish guy from LA. My personal lived experience couldn't be further from the lived experience of the people who were caught in the middle of this policy. And number one, support people who can tell these stories in a way that it doesn't take them years of research to really understand um, what happened so that we, you know, it doesn't take this long to untangle all of this. But, but the other thing is follow closely the work of everybody um, here the work that Justice in Motion is doing, that PHR is doing, that ACLU is doing, that the Women's Refugee Commission is doing, that Kids in Need of Defense is doing, um, that Al Otrolado, the small pro bono legal services organization representing some of the families already coming back um, are doing. And I think most importantly, as a journalist, um, do not give the Biden administration the benefit of the doubt. That's our job as journalists. You know, I'm not here to be happy about the fact that Donald Trump is gone or sad about the fact that Donald Trump is gone. I was here because I ended up in the in Casa Padre and the Ursula Processing Center at the epicenter of the policy um, and was telling the story of what happened because I happened to be there. That story is not done. And there's a lot of that story yet to be told. And the Biden-Harris administration has now an incredibly important um, consequential role in bringing this to an end or at least mitigating the damage caused by this. And now is not the time to turn away. So just to echo what I said before, um, this is as important, if not more important today than it was um, when we when there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in the summer of 2018. Thank you. And, and Lee, for one minute, um, ACLU and other legal mechanisms, I, I'm assuming that you're going to continue charging forward? We are. The lawsuit is continuing. We're pushing there. And we'll also be continuing to push the the Biden administration. I think it's absolutely critical that people speak out. And I just want to make one point about what Karen Deep said. It is so critical that we not let any population be dehumanized. I think that was the mistake the Trump administration. Uh, they thought in the first two years they had dehumanized these people from Central America to such an extent that the American people would not get you know, they would, they would not be outraged that they could take little babies away. Some of them were six months old and the American public wouldn't be outraged because they wouldn't see the Central American families uh, as human beings. And I think to the extent there's a silver lining in any of this, and that's a you know, hard thing to say, um, it's that the American public, both the left and the right pretty much, was outraged by this. And the Biden and Har Harris team needs to continue hearing from people. And, and never let this kind of thing happen where people can be so dehumanized that, that this kind of thing will happen. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody um, for joining us and thank you to the, this amazing panel. Um, again, with leaving you with the idea of the, the, the dehumanization and stripping people of dignity and what it can do to the human soul and human spirit and to us as a nation and, and as a society. So, um, and then of course we've heard about the urgency and the continued urgency of the situation and not letting up. Um, and um, so let's keep going at it, all of us. And I'm just gonna turn it uh, back to you, Donna, for final remarks. Thank you, everybody. Renee, thanks so much. Thank you for organizing and moderating the discussion today. It was so rich. Um, we could have gone on for much, much longer in this conversation. And I really wanna thank our panelists for making the time for this discussion today. We know that you have a lot on your plates. I know Lee, you mentioned that you'll be in court in a couple hours uh, with your superpowers. And so we're cheering you on. Um, but thank you panelists, most of all for the work you're doing and your tireless advocacy. Um, as difficult as this situation is, there are dedicated, persistent, dogged advocates working to right this wrong. And so we need to support their efforts by supporting their organizations. Um, as was mentioned earlier today, the legal efforts are made so much easier and more likely to succeed with public outcry. So that is something that everyone can do. Um, we can share today's webinar, which will be posted back on our websites, share it with others who could raise their voices or are in a position to act. Um, you know, clearly there's been momentum that's been created and the incoming Biden-Harris administration has promised to remedy the situation and make sure it never happens again. But as we mentioned, vigilance is so important. And I can tell you 
um, that that is our job. And we learned that lesson from the Obama administration. There will be many issues that this administration will have to deal with. And this needs to be on the top of the queue. Um, and that these deterrent based policies that are so cruel and inhumane are multiple. So regardless of any administration in our office, our job is to hold them to account. Um, so let's make sure that it does get in the history books and when it does that we show that we turn this policy around that we put policies in place to ensure this can never happen again. And that there is reunification there's accountability and there's really meaningful reparations for those who have suffered through this policy. So I really wanna thank everyone for doing the incredible work that you're doing and, uh, and bringing your voices here today to this webinar. So thank you everyone, keep up the good fight. We, we're with you, thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone.